This witch hunt in American history, that was President Trump on the Russia collusion investigation today, but he would not say whether he'll agree to be interviewed by the special counsel. The definition of the word wall is now in the mix in government funding negotiations. And two Democratic senators join us to talk Equifax, the future of their party, and immigration. This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. President Trump is standing firm for his border wall, but apparently wavering on whether he will talk with the special counsel investigating allegations his campaign colluded with the Russians, allegations he is again calling a Democratic hoax. The president making those comments as he welcomed a Nordic visitor today. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts was there and joins us from the North Long. Good evening, John. Brett, good afternoon to you. Good evening to you, rather. President Trump has been absolutely consistent in his assertion that there was no collusion between his campaign and the Russians to throw the U.S. election. But in what the president's legal team may believe may be the final chapter in the Mueller investigation, he has suddenly injected some new uncertainty. Are you open to meeting with him? Would you be willing to meet with him without condition? With the Prime Minister of Norway at his side, President Trump today played down the idea that he would sit for an interview with Special Counsel Robert Mueller, insisting since there is no evidence of a crime, there is no need for one. It has been determined that there is no collusion and by virtually everybody. So we'll see what happens. But again, would you, would you be open to We'll it? see what happens. I mean, certainly I'll see what happens. But uh, when they have no collusion and nobody's found any collusion at any level, uh, it seems unlikely that you'd even have an interview. His position today on a possible interview stood in sharp contrast to the other two times President Trump has been asked about it. First, on June 9th of last year. So if Robert Mueller wanted to speak with you about that, you I would, would be, be glad to, to tell him exactly what I just told you, John. Then, this past weekend at Camp David, when he quickly said, yeah, but again affirmed his innocence. There's been no collusion. There's been no crime. In December, the president's attorneys began talking with the special counsel's office about the possibility Mueller would ask for an interview sometime in the next few weeks. Sources say the president's legal team will insist on strict parameters for any sit-down with Mueller. Asked by Fox News about a possible interview, President Trump pointed out what he believes was the special treatment given to Hillary Clinton in her July 2016 interview with the FBI. Hillary Clinton had an interview where she wasn't sworn in, she wasn't given the oath, they didn't take notes, they didn't record, and it was done on the 4th of July weekend. Uh, that's perhaps ridiculous, and a lot of people looked upon that as being uh, a very serious breach, and it really was. Sources tell Fox News that despite the president's newly articulated position today, his legal team expects there will be an agreement for some sort of interview with Robert Mueller in the coming weeks. Donald Trump, shame on you! The president left no doubt today where he stands on his demand a border wall be included in any legislative fix for the so-called dreamers. It's got to include the wall. We need the wall for security. We need the wall for safety. We need the wall for stopping the drugs from pouring in. During his freewheeling meeting with members of Congress yesterday, the president gave many conservatives heartburn when he pretty much said he'd accept whatever Congress decides. My positions are going to be what the people in this room come up with. Today, the president said he will accept nothing less than a bill that includes construction of a wall. And meeting with his cabinet, the president gave himself high marks for yesterday's remarkable glimpse behind the legislative curtain. Actually, it was reported as incredibly good. And my performance, of, you know, some of them called it a performance. I consider it work. But got great reviews by everybody other than two networks who were phenomenal for about two hours. <laughs> then after that, they were called by their bosses and say, oh, wait a minute. And unfortunately, a lot of those anchors sent us letters saying that was one of the greatest meetings they've ever witnessed. Today, President Trump also vented his displeasure to San Francisco District Judge, a federal judge who blocked his plans to rescind the DACA protections for the so-called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. The DHS Secretary, Kirsten Nielsen, today said she doesn't think that that's going to affect efforts to get a DACA fix legislatively, but what it might affect is negotiations over the budget and whether or not DACA should be a part of that. Brett? More on that in a minute. John Roberts on the North Lawn. Thanks. 
The president and his Republican colleagues are also angry about the release of critical testimony in the Russia investigation by a senior Democrat. Testimony that has only raised more questions today. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge has the latest on that tonight. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brad. The powerful Republican chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee said the ranking Democrat Dianne Feinstein's decision to release the transcript from Glenn Simpson, whose firm was behind the dossier, is a breach of trust that could derail efforts to secure Jared Kushner's testimony. The president President's son in law. These transcripts would have been released eventually anyway, uh, but I think it does create some problems. For instance, when you're getting people to voluntarily come to you. Senator Grassley was asked but did not comment on this tweet where President Trump called Senator Feinstein sneaky, underhanded, and her actions possibly illegal. All of this went down as Democrats released a new report commissioned by Senator Ben Cardin that documented the Russian president's decades-long strategy to undermine democracy, and it concluded Moscow will likely target the 2020 elections, Brett. A new defamation suit today over the dossier, uh, the firm behind the dossier, actually. Well, that's right. The president's longtime personal attorney, Michael Cohen, is seeking more than $100 million in damages, su suing Fusion GPS, the firm behind the dossier, and BuzzFeed, who published the memos online exactly a year ago today. On Twitter, Cohen said, enough is enough of the fake Russian dossier. And without mentioning Cohen or the author behind the controversial book, Fire and Fury, the president said the legal system is outdated. Things that are false, knowingly false, and uh, be able to smile as money pours into your bank account. At the heart of the dossier is former British spy Christopher Steele, who pulled intelligence from his Russian contacts for the document. Steele was a known quantity to the FBI incredible, according to the nation's former top spy. Chris Steele was regarded uh, as a competent professional, dedicated professional, and I think it speaks to his uh, instincts, his professional instincts, that when he uh, grew concerned about what he was learning, that he first apparently reported this to his own government as well as to the FBI. The special counsel office confirmed today that it hired a veteran cybersecurity prosecutor, Ryan Dickey, in November. Cyber crimes are a central issue for the probe after the DNC and Clinton campaign hack spread. Kevin, thank You're you. Welcome. South Korea's president says President Trump deserves big credit for yesterday's meeting with North Korean officials. That session produced an agreement that will send a delegation from the North to next month's Winter Olympics in South Korea. Officials are also hoping to eventually have talks about North Korea's nuclear program. We've learned today that Vice President Pence will lead the American delegation to the Games. Pence will be with Martha McCallum next hour. President Trump is about to make a major decision involving Iran's nuclear program. He has until the end of this week to determine whether the Western agreement with Iran should be continued, or at least the U.S. involvement in it. Correspondent Rich Edson tells us what's at stake tonight from the State Department. Sources close to the president say he will likely pass on withdrawing the United States from the Iran nuclear deal as the next deadline approaches, essentially holding together an agreement he says he loathes. This is one of the worst deals ever made by any country in history. It also gave the regime an immediate financial boost and over $100 billion its government could use to fund terrorism. Frankly, that deal is an embarrassment to the United States, and I don't think you've heard the last of it. Believe me. Over the next several days, President Trump must decide whether to continue waiving sanctions against Iran, lifted as part of the 2015 Iran nuclear agreement. Within the week, the administration must also tell Congress whether Iran is complying with the major components of the nuclear deal. In October, the administration, for the first time, refused to certify Iran's compliance, keeping the U.S. in the deal, though giving Congress a greater role in developing Iran's strategy. The goal is actually to get a better deal, and the way you do that is to create the conditions through more pressure and also to re-govern the way under which the U.S. is a party to the deal. Sources close to the discussion say Secretary of State Rex Tillerson met today at the White House and this weekend at Camp David with the president to discuss these deadlines, pointing out progress on congressional negotiations. Lawmakers are considering reducing how often the president must make these decisions on waivers and certifications. They're also debating stronger enforcement of the nuclear deal and more measures to penalize Iran's ballistic missile program. 
These deadlines arrive as there are reports from Iran that it is arresting, torturing, and killing those who've protested across the country. The White House press secretary says Iran should release all political prisoners, adding, quote, Iran's regime claims to support democracy, but when its own people express their aspirations for better lives and an end to injustice, it once again shows its true brutal nature. While the U.S. lobbies allies to support changes to the Iran nuclear deal, European diplomats are meeting tomorrow with Iran. The U.S. allies will reportedly reassure Iran's foreign minister that they remain committed to the deal. Right. Rich Edson, live at the State Department. Rich, thanks. Stocks were down today. The Dow lost 17. The S&P 500 dropped three. The Nasdaq gave back 10. Governors in several states are trying to get the same deal that Florida is getting regarding offshore oil drilling. Correspondent Phil Keating tells us the latest decision from the Trump administration reverses a policy announced just last week. With 1,300 miles of coastline and white powder beaches generating nearly $70 billion a year in tourism, Florida is special. Just listen. Florida is unique. Florida is obviously unique. Florida is different. Certainly different now than every other coastal state. President Trump's executive order last week declared his plans to dramatically expand offshore drilling for oil and gas. Immediately, Florida Republicans bucked the president, including the GOP governor, senator, and congressman, siding with Democrats and environmental groups opposing the move, citing tourism, which suffered significantly during 2010. Deepwater Horizon disaster and military training needs off the Florida Panhandle. We are highly developed residential uh, coastline. A lot of uh, tourist uh, industry is our main industry, and we can't suffer the risks of another, another BP Horizon. Governor Rick Scott asked to meet with the Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, and they did Tuesday evening at the Tallahassee Airport. And the result coastline. was quick. And so for Floridians, uh, we are not drilling off the coast of Florida. But since President Trump is urging Governor Scott to run against Florida's Democratic Senator Bill Nelson this November, Nelson and others see ulterior motives. Twelve years ago, Nelson helped craft the current Eastern Gulf of Mexico moratorium that bans rigs within 125 miles of the Florida coast. Quote, this is a political stunt orchestrated by the Trump administration to help Rick Scott, who has wanted to drill off Florida's coast his entire career. We shouldn't be playing politics with the future of Florida. Either way, you won't be seeing any rigs off of Florida anytime soon. And no surprise, other governors quickly weighed in. New York's Governor Cuomo asking, where do we sign up for a waiver? And New Jersey's Governor Christie also asking for the same exemption that Florida got. Brett. Phil Keating in Miami. Phil, thanks. At least 15 people have died and 24 are missing in massive mudslides in Southern California. The area, as we told you, was ravaged by recent wildfires, and that is making the situation exponentially worse. National correspondent William Lajeunesse is in Montecito, California tonight. Home after home destroyed, some torn off their foundation, others leveled by boulders and trees. Three in the morning, early morning hours, all the debris just came down. It sounded like cars were being dragged. You know, we saw the boulders, the rocks. I tried, tried to get out and couldn't. Rivers of mud and debris washed down the hillside after torrential rains hit much of Southern California following the worst fire season in history. Every hill you see around here was on fire. And when we know that the dirt is loose and it, it, the rain comes, we knew it was coming. We just didn't know it was going to be this bad. The only words I can really think of to describe what it looked like was it looked like a World War I battlefield. More than a dozen dead, including Roy Roeder, a Catholic school educator swept from his home. The sheriff says many others remain unaccounted for. Helicopters and high water trucks rescued hundreds while others were trapped. We couldn't get out on time. Basically, is what happened. We were digging trenches around the house. Unlike fires, which residents can see and smell, mudslides come without warning. By the time you hear one, it's too late. We thought it would be just rain. Okay, we've had rain before, but nothing like this. The Thomas fire lasted four weeks. The rains that caused this slide lasted less than four hours. Yet the death toll could be up to 10 times as high. Why? The sheriff says 80 to 90 percent of residents ignored evacuation orders. A lot of frustration on the part of people who had been evacuated for a number of days during the fire, obviously, and nobody likes to be evacuated from their home. And, 
and um, I think the thought was that you know this is probably not going to to to, to be a problem, but ultimately it obviously was. So the controversy going forward, some of those residents were under a voluntary, not a mandatory evacuation, and they were hit the hardest. Problem is, predicting a mudslide is an inexact science, but the 101 could stay closed all weekend. Back to you. Amazing. William, thank you. Up next, Democrat Senators Elizabeth Warren and Mark Warner on their bill to hold credit monitoring companies accountable after last year's big Equifax data breach. Talk about other topics, too. First, first, here's with some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 6 in Birmingham as Toyota and Mazda announced the selection of Huntsville, Alabama, for a new production plant. The facility will eventually employ about 4,000 people. The plant will build 300,000 vehicles per year starting in 2021. Fox 45 in Baltimore as Maryland's Republican governor announces a push for term limits for state lawmakers. Larry Hogan saying he wants to eliminate what he calls career politicians to try to fight corruption. And this is a live look at New York from our affiliate Fox 5. One of the stories they're covering tonight, a large chunk of ice falls from a building in Manhattan and crushes the roof of a parked vehicle. Happened yesterday in Soho. No one was hurt, fortunately. The city is advising property owners and contractors to secure properties during snow and ice melt conditions. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. One of the many things you probably take for granted when you go to the doctor or the hospital is that bag of fluid they hook up and put on a pole next to you. Believe it or not, there's major concern tonight over the supply of those items. And it all has to do with one of last year's hurricanes in the Caribbean. Correspondent Matt Finn explains tonight from Chicago. Get your homework done. Every day, Wanda Volchko, a single mother of two, fights off the side effects of lupus. She's also survived two strokes and leukemia, making her dependent on monthly immune boosting infusions that have to be diluted with saline because she's extremely sensitive to some treatments. But the last time she went in for her infusions. I was just really shocked when they're just like, well, we don't have a saline bag. And the nurse told me really nervously, she's like, I really hope you don't have a reaction. Wanda, like so many other Americans, have been stunned to learn Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico damaged the majority of plants that manufacture IV saline bags, causing a nationwide shortage, forcing medical professionals to spend up to 30 minutes or more manually injecting fluids. People think, you know, well, the hurricane happened in Puerto Rico, but what people don't realize is it affects people here. In a letter to the FDA, the American Hospital Association says the saline bag shortage is a huge problem and on the brink of a significant health crisis. Doctors say a lack of saline bags could be dire. It's the very first thing that we give to the patients when they come in um, from a gunshot or a motor vehicle accident. They've had a loss of blood and we immediately have to bulk it back up and give them the fluids. Fortunately, the FDA reports one of the largest manufacturers of the bags, Baxter, says its Puerto Rico plants are online again, but it could be months before production is fully restored. Until then, some hospitals and clinics are forced to decide which patients get bags and when, leaving routine patients like Wanda feeling guilty, wondering if she's using a bag that's critical to someone else's life. Because I've been there, I've been that cancer patient in the chair who's needed it, and it's so not fair to them. The FDA is also monitoring other drugs manufactured in Puerto Rico, and it says the saline shortage will improve in a couple of weeks. But we talked to one clinic in California that says it has enough saline to get to February, and then after that, it'll have to reassess. Brett. Matt, thank you. The Republican exodus in Congress continues tonight. California Congressman Darrell Issa says he will not seek re-election. He's just the latest in a growing number of veteran Republican lawmakers who are giving up their seats at the end of their terms. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel tonight on what is shaping up to be midterm mayhem. I came to Congress for a four-year tour, and I stayed for now going on 18. California Republican Congressman Darrell Issa is the latest in a wave of congressional departures. Issa rejected a suggestion that his district could go to a Democrat in November. The economy says everything about the policies that uh, that my party and this president helped champion, and uh, so it's a good time to go out on top. At this stage, 46 House members, 32 Republicans, 14 Democrats are retiring or running for other office. The number of Republican departures is the most for one party since 1994. 
during President Clinton's first term when the GOP seized control of Congress in the Republican Revolution. This year's departures include seven current committee chairmen. So Speaker Paul Ryan and Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy must now deal with a substantial loss of institutional knowledge. McCarthy downplayed the significance of veteran lawmakers leaving. So, yeah, are there more Republicans? Yes, because there's more Republican members. We will bring more people in. It'll be successful in that. And that's the uniqueness that we have. The competition makes even people better. However, McCarthy and other California Republicans are likely to face some heat back home after the tax package limited the state and local deduction in a high tax state. There are also three Republican senators retiring, including Chairman Orrin Hatch and Bob Corker. And Democrats continue attacking the tax package. The Republican majority, which conveniently forgot its long history of opposing deficits when passing a $1.5 trillion tax bill, cannot in good conscience turn around and complain about deficits here. One veteran House lawmaker in a competitive district worries about holding on to the GOP majority in the fall. This political climate right now is about as bad as it could be for GOP members in moderate districts. We see the future and it ain't pretty. Democrats are watching these retirements with big plans to turn these seats from red to blue now that their candidates won't be taking on an incumbent. Brett. Mike Emanuel on the Hill. Mike, thanks. More on this with the panel. Just moments ago, President Donald Trump signaled, or rather signed, legislation aimed at giving customs and border protection agents additional tools to stop the flow of illicit drugs. This bill ensures agents will have portable chemical screening devices at ports of entry and mail facilities. It appropriates $9 million for hundreds of new screening devices, laboratory equipment, and facilities. The president has been saying fighting drugs, specifically opioids, is a big, big part of this uh, push by his administration. We'll follow that. Making credit reporting companies more accountable after the Equifax breach that probably affected you. Two senators are giving it a shot. We'll talk about that and other topics when we come back. A pair of Democratic senators going after credit monitoring companies following last year's massive data breach at Equifax. Senators Elizabeth Warren and Mark Warner are here tonight to talk about what they're trying to accomplish. Senators, thanks for joining me. Thank, Thank you, Brett. You. Talk about this legislation and what specifically it does. So you remember last fall when uh, Equifax announced that they had managed to not take enough care of consumers' data and more than half of all Americans had had their privacy breached. So their social security numbers, their credit card numbers, their phone numbers, their addresses are all out there in the hands of thieves. And here's the deal. It actually turns out that Equifax may actually make money off the breach. Now, Mark and I thought that was really a bad deal. And so we decided to put together some legislation that says when one of these credit reporting companies Companies, let your data get stolen like that, they're going to have to pay a substantial automatic penalty for it, and the people whose data get lost are actually going to get some money from that. And so, Senator Warner, let me just ask this. There are not a lot of defenders of Equifax. I mean, both sides of the aisle. It's not a, a black hat that's easy to defend. But what do you say to people who say that this legislation is really punitive, and there are a lot of companies who have data breaches uh, over the past year. Well, Brett, this is not the first time one of the credit reporting agencies have had this kind of breach. We've had choice point experience, and what's particularly different about this relationship is none of us, I was one of the victims of the breach, none of us offered our data to any of these credit reporting agencies. We have a no direct customer relationship. We think in a world where data is going to become more and more uh, taken in by companies, particularly when you're dealing with something as important as your credit history, there needs to be a stricter sense of liability. Yeah, Quite so honestly, we think there's going to be a lot of bipartisan support for this. Understand, this is not a big regulatory approach. We're not saying the government's going to say you've got to go this way and then you've got to turn this way and then you've got to take three steps and turn this way again. We're not saying that at all. We're saying take the appropriate steps because if you don't take the appropriate steps, you're going to have to pay a penalty. And, and I want to ask you a couple other things, sure. uh, Broad. 
topics, I look at the two of you standing together and I see kind of two sides of the Democratic Party. Uh, who and do you think areas is the, where we actually agree? Yeah, yeah. Who do you think is the leader of the Democratic Party right now? Listen, I think what the Democratic Party has at this point is a broad base of leaders that range from very progressive to people who have been traditionally more pro-business, and we actually find ways to work together on the vast majority of issues. What does unite us, though, is the sense that everybody in this country ought to get a fair shot. The right question is, where is the energy in the Democratic Party? And I'll tell you exactly where the energy is in the Democratic Party. It's down at the grassroots. It's down there person by person, family by family, who say, Wait a minute. I got a stake in how this government works. All right, let me get and I'm tired question. of a government sure. that works for those at the top and doesn't work for so, me. So, Senator Warren, you said that uh, the tax law was uh, a giveaway, essentially, to billionaires yep. and giant corporations. So yep. if Democrats take control of Congress, would you repeal the tax law? Well, what we have to do is change it. You got to take out the parts that are giant giveaways to big corporations that right now the Republicans plan for hard work working families to eventually pay for it. Sure, but you have companies, Senator, like Eversource in Massachusetts, the electricity company, announcing that they're going to give a big break to consumers. And good for them. And so I'm which ones do you take out that. of the list? Look, it is a trillion and a half dollars that the Republicans gave away to billionaires and to giant corporations. And they expect hardworking families to just pick up the ticket on that. I want those breaks to go directly to hardworking families, not to a bunch of rich folks. Okay, you agree Let with me, that, Senator Warner, about here's, companies? Here's, here's what I would say. One, I actually think, as somebody who's been on your show a lot of times, being concerned about the debt and deficit, I think this bill is actually going to add about $2.2 trillion to the debt. That really disappoints me in terms of what we're passing on to our kids. Okay, Senator I would, let, me, let, me just finish, let me just finish this one point, Brett. I, would, I do believe, and Elizabeth may and I may or not fully agree, but I think there were ways to bring back some of those profits that were caught offshore. But what we could have done in this bill was said, you want to bring those profits back. Yeah. You've got to invest some of those profits in actually training up people who are making, say, less than $90,000 a year. We ought to make sure that those communities that have been hit hard by trade yeah. actually get some of the benefits. There I mean, was obviously, a way we could have done this obviously. that would have been actually focused rather than the way it was rushed through with only one team. Gotcha. Obviously, the Republicans point to the communities and the hard workers who are getting checks and, and seeing electric bills go down. But, Senator Warner, um, the House is on the verge of passing this reauthorization of Section 702 of FISA, um, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance uh, Amendments Act. National Security Agency says it's crucial. Uh, the House can do it. It seems like Senator Paul is going to filibuster this. Um, how do you, wh what do you do here? How important is this? I think as Vice Chairman of the Intelligence Committee, I think this provision is very important, number one. Number two, I think I have not seen any evidence of abuse. But I would say, number three, and this is very important, important is that the bill that will come before the House and uh, that I've signed off in a bipartisan way, a number of us in the Senate have, will include for the first time ever a warrant provision if an FBI agent, for example, is trying to use this 702 information on a criminal case. And it will also make sure that the Bureau in particular categorizes all the 702 inquiries so a year out from now we'll have a much clearer pattern for those folks uh, on both sides of the aisle who may question this provision. We're going to have more data to give them to show if there needs to be further yeah, it's just running out of time. Yeah, it's, we're running out of time, and that's why I think it's important that it gets uh, moved forward in the next couple of weeks. We've got a lot that's got to be dealt with in the next couple of weeks. Candidly, I, I wish we wouldn't have punted so many of these issues, like the, the full budget from September 30th to now January 20th. Okay, and Senator Warren, and last, and, last and thing. And I should add, and children's health insurance, and children's and health community insurance. health care. We've got all these things that yeah, need to DACA, be taken care of. You know, Senator Warren, in, on and DACA, Rios. if you... If you characterize it as border security and don't call it a wall, is there a deal that can be made with Democrats in this administration? Let's start with the heart of what it's about. America made a promise to these young people, and that is that if they would come out of the shadows, if they would be vetted, that they would then have a chance to work in the United States, to go to school in the United States, to join our military, and that's what about 97% of them have done. 
And then Donald Trump said that promise is no good anymore. Now Congress has got to find a way to stand this back up. My view of this is America honors its promise. We do not deport 800,000 young people from the only home they have ever Even known. Even if it means shutting down the government and having this battle if there's a win over border security I, or calling it a wall. I, I don't want to see any of that come to pass. What I want to see is America honor its promises. And I recognize we're sitting down right now in negotiations trying to figure out who can give a little here, who can give a little there. But at the end of the day, the way I see this is we cannot say to 800,000 young people who right now are contributing to America, who right now we're hearing from their employers saying, don't get rid of these people. These are people we need in our economy. We cannot say to them, you will be deported from America. The clock is ticking here. Senators uh, Warren and Warner, uh, thanks for the time. Thank, Thank you. President Trump refuses to say whether he will speak with the special counsel in the Russia investigation, but he is speaking loudly, confirming the wall is a must. We'll talk about it all with the panel when we come back. We want to see something happen with DACA. It's been spoken of for years. And children are now adults in many cases. We are very disappointed by the decision, uh, but what we heard yesterday at the meeting was we're all committed to finding a deal. So a permanent solution is actually to the benefit of all the current DACA recipients, and that's what we'll pursue. The ruling in last night in no way diminishes the urgency of resolving the DACA issue. On this, we agree with the White House, who says the ruling doesn't do anything to reduce Congress's obligation to address this problem now. Well, a U.S. Uh, district judge uh, ruling last night that the administration overstepped its bounds in rolling back uh, DACA, saying that those uh, children had to leave uh, the U.S. eventually if Congress didn't weigh in. Uh, the president tweeting, it just shows everyone how broken and unfair our court system is when the opposing side in a case such as DACA always runs to the Ninth Circuit and almost always wins before being reversed by higher courts. We'll see where it goes. Just moments ago, the president was in that signing we told you about on the interdiction, the drug interdiction, and he said something at the end that caught everybody's ears. I'm going to sign this, and it's a, a step, and it feels like a very giant step, but unfortunately it's not going to be a giant step because no matter what you do, this is something that keeps pouring in, and uh, we're going to find the answer. There is an answer. I think I actually know the answer, but I'm not sure the country is ready for it yet. A little shrouded.